Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, Facebook Live, live streaming with Ortho Virginia. I'm Dr. Shane McGowan. I am an orthopedic uh, spine surgeon here at Ortho Virginia in the Parham office. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I get a lot of questions in and outside of the office about leg pain, leg numbness, back pain, how it all connects, um, and, and how we can help you with those types of symptoms. So I thought it might be a really good idea to sit down with everyone and have just a quick discussion about lumbar radiculopathy and how we can treat pain and numbness in your legs and even in your back in some cases. I want this to be a very fluid type of event here, so please feel free to stop me at any time. I believe questions are coming in through uh, Facebook via text message. Text, I believe, is the way that we're doing it today. And so uh, if you just uh, type in the box there, any questions that you have, we'll stop the, the talk really quick. We'll answer that question and we'll keep on going. All right, so let's get started here. We have a, a game plan moving forward here. A few different things that we're gonna wanna look at here. First, we need to know what the anatomy is of the spine, how the spine works, what does it look like, uh, what is it responsible for. Then we're gonna um, go through things like, you know, what does a normal spine MRI look like? What does an abnormal uh, MRI look like? What are the causes of the pain and the numbness in our legs? How does the back play into this pain and numbness in the legs? How do we prevent the pain and numbness from coming in our legs? What symptoms are emergent, non-emergent? When should you see a doctor? When should you stay at home? And then we'll briefly talk at the end about some treatments uh, we're not going to talk a lot about treatments today. I feel like that's a much deeper conversation that uh, if it comes down to requiring treatment for such uh, symptoms that we maybe should be having together in our office. Okay, so quickly, let's talk about um, you know, how common pain associated with the spine is. 70 to 90% of the population at some point in their life will experience back end or neck, uh, neck pain disease at least once in their lives. It's uh, estimated to cost about $10 billion a year in lost work expenses. It's one of the top three reasons why people go to the emergency department is for that back pain, that neck pain, and that leg pain, and the associated diseases and issues associated with them. Um, and it can obviously, as we're discussing today, affect more than just your back uh, or your neck. In severe cases, it can affect your ability to walk, hold objects. It can make urinating or defecating much more difficult. And there's even more than that, but those are just some of the top things that we see with spine disease. So spinal anatomy is slightly complicated. We're gonna try and just give the 10,000 foot overview here today. Essentially, our spinal cord is protected and is held in place by the spine itself. The spinal cord runs from the brain all the way down our spine and into our limbs, as well as our organs, where it performs its functions. Two of the most important functions that the spinal cord and its associated nerves that it gives off running into the limbs are what we call dermatomes and myotomes, fancy words for muscle motion, as well as sensation in our body. If you look at the picture off to the left there, you see that fancy colorful guy and he's got all sorts of lines drawn on him with all sorts of different levels associated with him. It was a little small, but anyway, uh, what that is representing to us is that each level of the spine is responsible for a different sensation pattern on the body. For instance, the L4 nerve root, which we're gonna talk about a little later, is responsible for sensation coming down the outside of your thigh, across the front of the knee, and then to the medial aspect of the shin. This is important when we're trying to diagnose where your symptoms might be coming from, what nerve might be responsible for it, and how we can help. If you look at the little muscle man next to him, that's a, we call it myotome man. And that represents what muscles are associated with the different nerves. Again, each nerve coming out of the spine is associated with a different muscle group and a different action. For instance, again, L4 is oftentimes associated with extension of the knee. If we start to have weakness and extension of the knee, then that points us to where the problem may be and we can focus our efforts there. In the picture to the right, this is a generalized schematic of what's happening in our spine, pretty much from the skull to the tailbone. That yellow portion in the middle is your spinal cord. And if you look between the bones, you'll see a thin little yellow line coming out to the side. 
That is the spinal nerve. That's the part that goes down to the body. And again, is responsible for the sensation motor that we saw in the two men next to us. Um, let's go to the next slide really quick. So here, this is a little more uh, in depth about what the actual bony elements and soft tissue elements in and around the spine that keep us together. The spine is used for several purposes. One is to protect these very sensitive spinal elements that run down the middle of the column that we just saw. The other portion is that it helps us maintain an erect position while we're standing, walking, sitting, even laying down. There are three major segments with a fourth segment way down at the bottom. You have your cervical spine, which is your neck, the thoracic spine, which is the entire portion of the spine that has ribs attached to it. That protects a lot of your vital organs. And then the lumbar spine, also known as the lower back. Today, we're gonna to be mainly focusing on the lumbar spine, although the entire spine is important, obviously. Below the lumbar spine, you have your sacrococcygeal region. This is the portion of the spine that connects to the pelvis and um, allows for a pelvic girdle, again, to maintain a standing erect position with our hips and other pelvic organs intact. If we look over to the left, we're gonna see a very nice schematic of the frame, famous Fred Netter, or excuse me, Frank Netter, excuse me, who um, does great illustrations of a lot of different anatomy in the spine. This particular uh, animation here on the top is an animation of the intervertebral disc. In between, in between each one of the segments that you can see over to the right is a disc separating those bones. That disc is a soft tissue element that allows shock absorption and motion between the spinal elements. This is partially what allows us to bend side to side, forward back, while still maintaining an erect position. In the center of that disc is a portion called the nucleus palposus. You can think of this as the jelly in the jelly donut. Around the outside is the annulus fibrosus. You can think of this as the more rigid portion of the jelly, of the donut that holds the jelly in place. As long as the jelly is maintained inside the middle of that, where everything is good, everybody's happy, and we're able to perform all the activities that are needed on a daily basis without pain or anything else. Below that is a, is a schematic of what, where the disc lives, that thin little gray section in between the two bones is where the disc normally lives. Directly behind that, you'll see a little opening. That opening is called the foramen. That's where the nerve leaves the spinal canal and goes to the body again to do its job. You can notice though, that if that disc were to push back in any capacity, it would severely limit the size of that foraminal canal. Therefore, we would put the nerve in danger of being pinched or crushed, what we call stenosis. So that's a generalized idea of what spinal anatomy is. Let's get a little more uh, into the fun stuff here. This is uh, an MRI of the, of particularly the lower back, the, the lumbar spine. This is what, again, we're talking about today is the lumbar spine. The lumbar spine is responsible for all sensation and motor in our legs. There are five lumbar spine elements. So it's L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. Below L5 is your sacrum, also known as your tailbone. Okay, and that is the very bottom of the spine. That is where the spine connects to the pelvis. If you look at the image over to the left, and if you count up from the bottom, one, two, three, four, five bones, that's the entire lumbar spine. In between each of those square bones in the front half of the picture there, you will see a light gray center and dark gray to black outer portion. Yes, that is a disc. You'll notice that behind the bone and the disc, there's a lot of white followed by gray, followed by white again. That, yet yeah, that thick gray line is where, no, go right in front of that. You had it before. There it is. So that portion right there, that's your spinal cord and your spinal nerves as it enters the lumbar spine. The white stuff around it is CSF fluid. So basically the CSF fluid at this level bathes all the nerves uh, in the spinal canal. This is one thing that we can use to show there's no pinching of the nerves. And if you look at the discs again, you can notice that it's a nice straight line. There's no bulging or herniating of the discs at this time. So this is what a lateral or looking side view of the spine of the MRI looks like. And this is a very nice looking spine. The image over to the right is looking at the spine from the bottom up. If you look at that round thing right in the middle of the uh, picture, that is the disc space again. The disc you can see is nice and round. There's nothing popping back into the spinal canal. The spinal canal is directly behind the disc space 
and it's that's it that's the spinal canal right there and you can see all the white fluid and each gray dot in the middle there is a nerve if you look off to the left and right you'll see a big opening where that exactly perfect so those big openings are there are transiting the nerves out of the spinal canal into the body those gray dots that she was just uh, hitting on to the left and the right those are the nerves that we're talking about here you can see that there's light gray around each of those nerves meaning there's nothing pinching them there's no stenosis there this patient does not have any radiculopathy does not have leg pain and very likely does not have any back we do have a question that came in which is how can you tell if your pain is coming from your hip or your back? That's a great question. And I think that's something we deal with on a daily basis in my office. It is not always easy to differentiate between hip pain and back pain, but there are a few different things that we can look at and to try to decipher between the two. Okay. Number one, a true classic joint pain from the hip, meaning inside the joint itself, is going to be seen mainly in the groin on the affected side. Most of the time, if it's a pain from the back, it will either be uh, going down the leg towards the foot, usually past the knee, or it will be isolated within the back itself in a particular pattern. This is getting a little outside what we're talking about today, but there's something called the SI joint. There are muscles called the erector spinae muscles that again, help hold us up. And all of those things can lead to back pain. Again, a little outside what we're talking about today, but outside of just having disc issues or pinched nerve issues in your back, you can have arthritis, you can have degeneration, and all of these things will lead to inflammation in the back itself. If you have inflammation in the back itself, it will create band-like pains that go across the back and sometimes towards the outside of the hip. That is unlikely to be true hip pain itself, and more likely to be something happening at your SI joint or arthritis or something like that. It's unlikely that that is a pinched nerve and is unlikely that that is being caused by something inside the spine itself. I hope that answers that question. Okay, so kind of onto the meat and potatoes of what we're talking about today. What causes leg pain? What causes leg numbness? So the number one thing that's going to cause this leg pain leg numbness is a pinched nerve in your lower back also known as stenosis okay the location in the spine where this pinched nerve happens will be directly associated with where you're feeling the pain in the lower extremity in your in your leg um, the most common structure that causes compression of the nerve is the intervertebral disc that we were discussing earlier there are other things that can also cause these issues osteophytes which are often seen with arthritis and is a new bone growth can also cause pinched nerves. The bone can grow into an area that's not supposed to, i.e. that foramen we were talking about earlier, and pinch the nerve. Unstable levels, sometimes in the lower back for whatever reason, trauma, uh, abnormal, abnormality at birth, um, whatever the case may be, something called anterostasis. These can cause unstable uh, vertebral levels where you have shifting of one vertebrae on top of another, which can also pinch nerves. Inflammation in spinal cysts, again, that oftentimes goes back to degeneration in the spine, can place pressure on the nerves. Um, and then uh, as well as uh, disc sequestration, which we're going to talk about a little further uh, in a minute here. So where the disc uh, herniates and impinges on the nerve will also affect where the leg symptoms uh, present. We just discussed that, right? So at L4, we expect to go through the knee onto the shin. L5, we expect to go more onto the foot. And that kind of gives us a roadmap to where we should be looking as we are doing the evaluation and treatment. That's typically the nerve and not the spinal cord that is compressed at these levels. Therefore, it's unlikely that the entire leg will be affected. I put this in there because there are sometimes where patients come in and they tell me their entire leg, front, back, inside, outside, the whole thing is numb. That is less likely uh, to be from something like we're talking about today. And it's more likely to be either an issue in with a nerve in the leg itself or an issue higher up in the spine. That, that can, in some cases, be emergent. And that's something that we should really be looking into uh, very quickly if, uh, if you have symptoms like that. Next slide. Okay, so again, I just wanted to delve in a little further into the disc herniation 
uh, issue here, just because I think it's a very simple way and a very straightforward way to, again, describe what pinched nerves look like and how they can affect you. If you look at the image all the way over to the left, you will see at uh, 5, 4, L2, L3, that you have a very large disc herniation from the front and a cyst coming from the back. And that is pinching right in the middle of the spinal cord, like we would look for a spinal canal, excuse me, as we were discussing earlier, you can see that thick gray line in the middle of the screen surrounded by white. That's the nerves and the spinal cord coming down. And you can see at that level that we're discussing, there's no room for all that fluid in, in there. That means that there is significant stenosis or pinching of the nerves at that level. The image next to it, which is not the same uh, patient, uh, if you look directly in the middle of the screen, you'll see that little white circle. That again is the spinal canal. Unlike that first MRI that we looked at, like looked at where everything was open on the sides, you can see those thin little that thin little black area cutting across just in front, cutting off the exit ramps or the foramen where the nerves go. That again is stenosis causing pinching of the nerves. This is better illustrated in the image over on the right. So if you, if you look at the nerve exiting on the right-hand side, you'll see that there's a wide open area, the disc is in the front, there's bone in the back, exactly, and there's nothing pinching that nerve as it leaves the spine to go to the body. If you look to the left side of that image, you will see that the nucleus palposus, the middle portion of the disc, has surged past the outside portion of the disc and is now placing severe pressure on that left-sided nerve. That's going to cause symptoms. The, these are the patients that often come in explaining to me that they have burning pain, electric pain down their legs, they may have weakness in their legs, they may have numbness in their legs, again, in that specific distribution that we discussed earlier. So once again, I want you to look at the two images over to the left, try to remember those for just a second, and can we go back to that first MRI? Right here, this is what a normal MRI looks like. Again, you can see there's nothing coming into the middle on that left picture. There's nothing in the middle of the screen there. It's all wide open. There's no pinching. There's no disc herniation. There's no cyst. There's no osteophyte. It's all wide open. The image to the right, again, you can see all wide open. There's nothing over in those foraminal regions where those little gray dots are in the middle that are pinching those dots. Therefore, this patient likely feels very, very well. Can you just make me go full screen for one second? Just to drive this point home a little further, this is my little, this is my little um, spine model that we tend to play with a lot here in the office. And this is only the lumbar spine, so you have your sacrum, right? Your tailbone again down here, and you can see five, four, three, two, one. This is your lumbar spine. This is everything that we're talking about today. I just think that this may be a slightly easier way to see how much room there actually is. So if we look at this right here, this is the nerve as it comes out of the spine. It needs to go down, down to the body, and it comes across just like that. If you see, if I take my pen, and if I put it directly in there, I can fit my entire pen in that opening, in that hole right there. That's how much room there is. You can see how much room the nerve has to move around. If we look straight down the spine, now we're looking at, spinal cord here and you can see all of that open room around it this is what you need in a normal spine to stay pain free if we grab my other model here thank you to make it a little obvious they made they made that disc herniation nice and red right in here and you can see i can no longer get my pen in there it's all tight that is the tightness that we're talking about this is what leads to that that nerve pain Unfortunately, I don't have one showing tightness in the middle of the spine, but you can imagine that if a disc came out like that, those nerves in that spinal cord would not be happy. We have a couple of questions that have come in. So one of them is, is the pattern usually bilateral or may it be only on one side? That's a great question. Um, that will depend. We're actually going to go over a slide in a second that may help identify, uh, define that a little more for you, but in general, it's usually more on one side than it is the other. And that is dependent on where the disc herniates, right? So if the disc herniates directly in the middle, it will affect both the left and the right nerves, okay? 
affect both the left and the right nerves. That therefore you'd have bilateral or both legs be affected. More classically, we tend to see the disc herniate a little more to the left or a little more to the right, and therefore it typically only affects one side or the other. If you have symptoms on both legs, that may indicate a more severe stenosis, a more severe uh, pinching of the nerves. It also may identify more abnormal motion, like we were talking about before. When this when this comes forward like that, you can see the abnormal motion. We'll put, well, it's not really doing it the correct way right here, but anyway, as these move forward, it will put pressure on the nerves, and that oftentimes will cause both legs to be affected, which oftentimes requires some more advanced type treatments. Okay. So how does the back play into leg pain and numbness? Uh, let's talk again about this lumbar disc herniation. We're kind of beating a dead horse here, but I just wanted to show you what a really large disc herniation looks like on an MRI. Um, I, this one to me seems pretty obvious, but if you look at the L4, L5 level, right where she's pointing with the cursor there, you will see a big round black disc that has herniated backwards into the spinal canal and is putting severe pressure on all of the nerves as they traverse down. Again, if you look at that thick gray line in the middle of the canal, those are all the nerves. And when it gets to that spot, right where that disc herniation is, there's absolutely no room for them. This is the type of disc herniation where you will have symptoms in both legs. How do we know that? Look over to the picture to the right. Normally, as we saw in the last two pictures, in the very center of that picture, there's a big white circle. That's all the fluid with all the little gray dots. That white circle is now down to a thin white line. Can you show them that right there? That's perfect, yes. The rest of all that black or dark gray stuff that you see in there, that is all a disc herniation. You can see as you go more forward in that disc herniation, it affects both sides equally. Therefore, this person's in trouble and this person, I would be very concerned about having something called cauda which I think is at the next slide. Why don't we move to the next slide? I think cauda is on the next slide. No, it's not. All right, we'll get to cauda -quina. So what causes intervertebral disc herniation? The truth is we don't 100% know every case what causes disc herniations. The obvious ones are trauma, right? You know, if you if you are if you injure your back, if you fall, if you have something fall on you, the disc is only so strong and it can herniate out the back and basically cause what we just saw. However, it's more than just trauma. There's something called uh, lumbar disc degeneration. We know that this is a natural part of aging. About 80% of the population by age 65 will have some form of degeneration. When we talk about degeneration, what we are specifically describing is that the intervertebral disc wears out, kind of like shocks on a car. After a couple hundred thousand miles, or in some cases, 100,000 miles, the shocks wear out, and instead of having a nice smooth ride, you start to feel all that bang, you feel every bump in the road. That's the same thing with the degeneration here. As the disc degenerates, it becomes more friable, and it potentially can lead to, to an easier disc herniation, meaning less trauma is required, or it can lead to more bone growth and other uh, and other obstructions that can cause pinching of the nerve. So disc degeneration is definitely one cause. Repetitive mo mo movements over and over again. The classic one is some uh, somebody uh, uh, that uses there's a lot of jackhammering at work. That repetitive up and down over and over again, eight hours a day, five days a week, year after year, that will degenerate your spine faster, and again can cause um, disc herniation and stenosis, and pinching of the nerves. Clinic, subclinical injury. There are times where patients will come in and say, hey, you know, I never really injured myself. What's going on here? And then they think back and they go, well, you know, I, I did have that fall. I never really felt anything from it. But then two or three days later, I started to feel these leg symptoms. That's what we consider a subclinical injury, meaning that you didn't notice it at the time. But that can actually cause tears in the disc, which can lead to disc herniation. And finally, genetics. Genetics, we know, is uh, very big, especially in the disc degeneration and stenosis portion later in life. Uh, and it's probably the number one cause of the pinched nerves and the symptoms going down the legs. Abnormality at birth and infection, obviously, are other causes. These are less common causes. Um, it's something that we often pick up on either uh, x-ray or MRI. Okay, so at this point, I think we kind of get the idea that there are many causes 
of leg pain that can be related to your back, right? We have the degeneration, we have the disc herniation, we have trauma, we have infection. We saw how these nerves are uh, affected and how they result in the different portions of the leg being affected, the strength being affected, the sensation being affected, all of that. I think all of us don't want that to happen to us. And so one of the best things that we can do to avoid that, the number one thing, and I stress this every single day in my clinic, is you have to perform stretching and strengthening exercises every single day. And I think we're going to try to put some of these exercises up on the website um, for you guys to have. They only take about 10 minutes to do, but the idea behind them is that if we maintain a flexible and strong core, it, it in some ways decompresses these nerves that may already have pressure on them and it allows the nerves to move easier with less pressure and less pain. Avoid heavy lifting, twisting, and bending motions. So instead of turning your body to put something down, sorry, excuse me, instead of turning at your waist to put something down, turn your whole body. Bend at your knees. Don't bend at your waist. Keep heavy objects close to your body, close to your core. If you do, if you do these things correctly, you're less likely to injure that disc, have it herniate, and create the symptoms. Obviously, body weight is important for just about every aspect of health. And in this particular case, we know that just about every pound uh, of weight we add on, it's equivalent to adding five pounds of weight onto our back based on lever actions. And so the, the more we can control our weight, the less pressure we have in the lower back, the less degeneration we get, the less likely we are to have these symptoms throughout life. Proper nutrition. There's some new studies out there that indicate that animal products may actually increase the risk of arthritis and degeneration. So maintaining a healthy lifestyle uh, with diet, green leafy vegetables, fr uh, fruits, lots of water will help maintain a well hydrated intervertebral disc, decrease the risk of arthritis, decrease the risk of the low, the back pain and the lower extremity pains. And obviously we need to see our doctors on a regular basis so we can catch these things early and hopefully avoid surgery. What are the emergencies here? Now we're gonna talk about caudal quina, which was that big old disc herniation we saw in the MRI a couple slides back. There are things known as red flags. If you have any of these red flags, this should be an immediate trip to the emergency department. This is not the time to wait and see if it gets better. This may have permanent and dire consequences for your ability to walk, urinate, defecate, and feel. So number one, inability to start urinating. We call this urinary retention. Inability to walk obviously. Numbness in your rectal and or genital areas and severe worsening of numbness or pain over a short period of time in your legs. If any or all of these are happening to you, at, and they typically happen very quick, usually over a few hours, if not a day, this is something you go to the emergency department about. We need an MRI. We need to look at it. And potentially, you may need surgery. The constellation of these symptoms together are known as cauda equina syndrome, which is just a fancy way of saying that instead of having one nerve pinched in our lower back, we're having all of the nerves pinched in our lower back, which means that everything from the waist down potentially can be affected. When is it time to go see a back specialist? You know, this one is a little more uh, up in the air, right? I never want to discourage anybody from coming to see me. I am happy to see you, whether you have one day of pain, whether you have a little pain, a lot of pain, whether you've had three years of pain, 10 years of pain, whether it's back pain, leg pain, whatever the case may be. But specifically for this radiculopathy, for the leg symptoms that we're talking about, if you have persistent back and leg pain or numbness lasting 12 weeks, or if you have worsening pain, numbness, weakness in your leg at any time, that's typically the time we say to get in and see a back specialist. There are often times, uh, or there are often periods of time when patients will complain of some back pain, some leg pain that will often go away on its own over a couple of days or a couple of weeks. So if it's just some minor pain in the leg, that is not something that you need to emergently go rushing in to see, you know, your doctor or a back specialist for, because we know that for the most part, they will get better on their own. Um, any pain that is associated with electric type pain, shooting pain, numbness or weakness in the arms or leg for any period of time should be seen by a doctor. When, we, when I say this, I mean it's a 9 out of 10 pain, a 10 out of 10 pain, it's an electric bolt of lightning going down your leg, 
it is burning going down your leg or complete numbness of a part portion of your leg. Those are the times that we say, hey, get in and see us so we can help control their symptoms and see if we can get you through this without any uh, major invasive type treatments. Uh, also, the quicker you get in to see us, um, the quicker we can get the correct imaging to diagnose exactly what is going on. I believe this is the last slide, is that correct? Okay. I just really want to quickly touch base on treatment options for this. So if we are dealing with just pain and or numbness, and it's only been there for a short period of time, you will often hear us uh, talk about things like medications, physical therapy, non-invasive type treatments. Oftentimes patients want to get an MRI right away. I completely understand the urge and the want for that because we want to figure out what's going on and treat it. The two big problems with that is, uh, number one, oftentimes insurance will not cover it if you've only had symptoms for a couple of days because they know that there's an 80% chance that those mild to moderate symptoms are going to get better on their own with what we call supportive care. So that's, that's one major issue with it. The other major issue is if there's no weakness or any other caught quantitative type symptoms, it's unlikely we're going to do any other types of treatments for at least four to six weeks unless you're having severe, severe symptoms. Our goal, as, as or my goal as a spine surgeon, is to get you better as much as I can while trying to avoid surgery. We only do surgery when we absolutely have to. And so the supportive measures, the injections, and all those other uh, less invasive or non-invasive aspects are a much better way to go, again, unless there's some sort of emergent situation there. We often get questions about you know, microdiscectomy versus laminectomy versus fusion versus taking bone out versus correcting the spine. And that's a much, much, much more in-depth uh, conversation. I think that was a little past what we're talking about here today. I mainly wanted to get across what the causes of these symptoms are and just some generalized treatment options. But if surgery is indicated for these types of symptoms, these, the leg pain, the leg numbness, the leg weakness coming from the back, Surgery may be required. It depends how big of a disc herniation you have, how much degeneration you have, how much pressure is being placed on the nerve, and how much it's affecting you. These are complex questions and complex answers. If surgery is required, it may or may not require hardware, such as screws and rods, or devices that actually take out the bad disc and fuse two levels together. These are all possibilities. And again, I think they're going in any further. That's a little more depth than what we would like to talk about today. But suffice to say that those are possibilities. They are out there, and we try to only use those when absolutely necessary. So I think that's about it. Um, are there any questions? Thank you, Dr. McGowan. And yes, there are some questions that have come in. So one of them is, how does a spine brace help after surgery? So that's a great question. There are several different uh, ideas behind the back brace. It depends what kind of surgery it was, okay? If there was no uh, fusion attempted in the surgery, oftentimes it's used as a supportive measure, okay? And so after surgery, you also you will often feel weak, uh, generalized body weakness, because the surgery takes a lot out of you. And one aspect of that is weakness in your back. We, if we're going through the back to do the surgery, we do have to go through all the muscle and bone to get down to the portion where we do our work. The muscles don't like that and they become weak for you know, a short period of time. In that case, the brace is there to help support our weak musculature and our, and our recovery um, so that we're not putting as much tension or pressure on the muscles to do their jobs, and it helps in that way. If a fusion was performed, um, it also, again, will help with the weakness and sturdying our upper body as we're uh, recovering, but it also may help decrease the amount of motion above and below where the fusion has taken place so that the fusion has a better chance of taking and solidifying in that fashion. Thank you. Are any of the treatments or surgeries done in an outpatient setting or does it require a hospital stay? Yeah, uh, again, that's a very, very in-depth conversation that I tend to have one-on-one -on -one with my patients. The answer is, Are there, is it possible to do it in an outpatient setting? Absolutely. There are several surgeries that I perform outpatient on a weekly basis. 
Uh, but there are also many surgeries that still require uh, inpatient, you know, overnight stays and whatnot. I do my best to try to get as many patients as possible out of the out of the hospital post op day one or post op day two. We don't like patients staying in there. We've learned now that the longer patients stay in there, the higher their the higher risk it is for uh, complications. Um, typically, the only time where we're really going to have to have patients stay in is if the patient had, you know, weakness and difficulty walking before or after surgery for whatever reason, um, or if there was uh, such a large surgery that we require more intense pain meds than we're able to provide at home. Uh, it's becoming less and less uh, every year. Thank you. Someone asks, what causes numbness and leg down to toes and tingling in the arm down to fingers? both at the same time i'm i'm assuming we're, we're asking um so there are many different things that can cause that uh now i'm assuming we're talking on the same side and i'm assuming we're talking all the way down the arm all the way down the legs to the toes i may be incorrect about the question but it sounds like that's what we're asking and the answer is that the issue may be in the neck instead of in the lower back or you're having an issue in the neck and the lower back um, and those are two different things. Those are two different diagnoses and those are two different treatment algorithms that we have to go through to figure out what's going on and correct it. Thank you. Are artificial discs being used in the lumbar area instead of fusion? The answer to that is yes, they are. Um, they, I think they're slowly catching on um, you know, with popularity. One of the issues that we've had with the lumbar discs in the past they've been around for a while now, was that they were they were wearing out very quickly. And so patients all the time would come back uh, relatively shortly after surgery, having back pain or having more leg symptoms. And we would get M MRIs and x-rays and we'd see that the lumbar disc had failed and we'd have to go back in and revise it. And nobody wants to go back in and do more spine surgery. That is uh, not good for anybody, especially the patient, right? And so. Uh, for the most part, we have stuck to the spinal fusions. Uh, for, for now, there are some uh, people out there still doing disc replacements. I believe they're starting to make a small comeback because they do have some slightly new technology out there that's promising. But I don't think we're fully there yet uh, like we are in the neck with doing disc replacements, having better outcomes uh, when it's used in the correct patient for the correct reason but we're getting there. Thank you. What would burning in the lateral thigh alternating with burning groin indicate? That's a great question. And it could be the same issue or it could be a different issue. So burning in the groin and potentially burning on the outside of the thigh could identify as S1 or S2 nerve root, especially if you feel it coming into the gluteal region. Again, that's just a different portion of the spine, a little lower. It could also uh, identify two different areas that are being affected. There may be a large disc herniation or there may be multiple levels that have degeneration that are causing multiple nerves to be affected on one side. Um, and so you could have, a, for instance, an L4 nerve that's being pinched on, let's say, the left side, along with an S1 nerve root that's being pinched on the left side, and you can get those two different symptoms. Another option, again, is if we have true groin pain and burning in the groin, in theory, that could also be from the hip. We, like we said earlier, we oftentimes see this concomitant, um, these concomitant symptoms of both hip pathology and lower back pathology. They kind of go hand in hand. They're, they're relatively close to each other from a musculoskeletal point of view. So if you have hip arthritis, that may make you walk differently, degenerate your back more or cause uh, abnormalities in the spine. So you have groin pain from the hip and then you have the radicular symptoms from the back. Thank you. These are all great questions, by the way. Is endoscopic for animal decompression possible in patients with high BMI? Is it possible? Yes. Would I recommend it uh, currently? Probably not, unless there was some very, very serious symptoms that were going along with it. Um, the yeah, so the endoscopic approach is it's it's an interesting approach. It's a relatively new approach to the spine. It has its advantages and disadvantages that I would be happy to discuss with uh, anyone in person. 
Um, and I think that it has a lot of potential in the future. I think we're still working out some of the bugs with it. BMI is a major factor when we talk about spine surgery. We know that higher BMI patients have a higher chance of, com of, uh, of complications and a higher chance of poor outcomes from the surgery. Um, the endoscopic portion may or may not have an effect on that. And I, I don't think we know the true answer to that yet, but that's a great discussion to have at first. Thank you. And our final question for today is, are you taking new patients? And if you are, which office are you in? So I am taking new patients. I am in the Parham location at Ortho, Virginia. I am happy to see anyone and, and everyone um, from just a little back pain all the way down to severe pain, severe numbness, severe weakness. I take care of everything from, I like to say head to toe or, or head to butt really, because it goes from the spine, connects your head all the way down to your sacrum, all the way down to your, to your pelvis. And I do, I do all of that. I do very small microdiscectomy surgery so we can get you up and running and, and back out as quickly as possible, all the way up to the very, very large revision spine surgeries, um, you know, where you may have had some issues in the past and we're having more issues now. And now those are bigger, more complicated things. And, and I like taking care of those as well. I like to think of myself as a true spine surgeon that takes care of whatever my patient has. And if for some reason it's something that I can't take care of, or I don't have the staff around me to help me take care of it, then I'm able to get you to the correct place very quickly so we can make sure whatever issue that you have can be taken care of correctly the first time as simple as possible. Thank you so much, Dr. McGowan. If you have a question that we have not had a chance to answer, please leave it in the comments and we will answer that way. Would you like to close? Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for spending the last hour with me. I thoroughly enjoyed this. If any of you have any further questions that uh, you want to discuss in person, I will be happy to sit down and talk to you uh, whenever, whenever you want. Again, I appreciate your time.